Our speaker today marks an interesting turn in our series. So today we've heard from a number of entrepreneurs who some of them have uh, started and sold their companies, some of them are just starting to start their companies, some of them have gone on to another, uh, other ventures in venture capital. Uh, what's interesting today is that this company, who we'll be talking about, has been in business over a decade. In fact, it was founded in 2001. It's Medallia, and it's a B2B company providing customer experience management software. And to date, a major part of their funding has come either internally or from venture capital investment. In fact, uh, one of the early ways I heard about Medallia was in August, there was a big news flash that Sequoia Ventures had invested 50 million, which I thought was quite interesting in Medallia, um, until I actually read they have invested almost 150 million. And in fact, if you've heard of Sequoia, which is one of the biggest venture capital uh, firms that there is, um, Medallia is their single largest investment. Um, so that should give you something about the, the, what's interesting about Medallia. Uh, today, our speaker will talk a little bit on insights of surviving entrepreneurial success. Um, so I think my understanding is that after two or three years, you're no longer a startup. So maybe it is entrepreneurial success now. Juan Pablo de la Rochelle is VP of Engineering at Medallia. He's known as an expert in the interactive voice response systems, and his work in building Argentina's first voice portal was recognized with application of the year from Intel. He's been with Medallia for over a decade, but you know he started when he was 10, obviously. <laughs> and as of late, it's been interesting for me because he's been blogging about engineering and hiring engineering managers. Uh, I find that interesting because I think it should be interesting to you all uh, in terms of hiring as well. And as part of that, uh, we are incredibly fortunate that Medallia is here not just um, with Juan Pablo to talk about what's happening at Medallia and their success, but also to talk to all of you all a little bit at a networking event afterwards. Um, so we will go to about 6 o'clock, and then everybody is invited to roll down the hill. I, I did also announce that the first four people who can't walk are allowed to walk go in the car with me. You'll just have to be like the kids in the car, but that's okay, I don't have a minivan. Um, but we're going down the hill to Skydeck. And so it's very important that whoever's gonna be attending this wonderful networking event with this incredible view of the campus be at the Skydeck between 6.20 and 6.45, because in order to get up, you need elevator access. Um, so roll on down the hill, enjoy the weather, and I guarantee you'll be greeted by an incredible group of people. Some of them are sitting here with great t-shirts on, um, and also some, yeah, there, there they are right there, and some wonderful appetizers. So without further ado, let me introduce, with pleasure, Juan Pablo. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being here. How's it going? Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah? All right, just let me see if we can get this out of the way. Uh, if I can find this. Just, let's see if um, we'll do this. All right. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, hopefully we can keep this very casual. Just have a few slides. I'm not gonna bore you too much uh, with things. And I thought I could actually uh, talk to you today about something slightly different than what I've seen um, uh, when we talk about startups, which is how do you get off the ground? Um, I joined Medallia when we were getting off the ground, and I think I have learned um, the hard way, if you want, a couple of lessons that I would love to share with you today. Um, before we begin, uh, I want to talk a little bit about, um, share with you who I am. Uh, as um, I said before, my name is Juan. I'm head of engineering at Medallia. I'm originally from, who can, uh, between my, oh, there you go, who said that? Yeah, Buenos Aires, there you go. I'm originally from Argentina, grew up in Buenos Aires. Um, and uh, me and computers uh, were love at first sight. This is my beloved Texas instrument, the first computer that I ever seen, that I ever touched, uh, had no way of storing absolutely anything anywhere. So every time that you turned it off, you had to retype everything. That's how I became a great typer as well. So um, all my programs, um, it could only do basic at the time. So I learned basic and I had to type everything every single time that I started working with it. Uh, and then my mom will call me to uh, have dinner. I'm like, oh, shh, 
and I had to turn it off. So I learned how to code in basic, and then I moved on to the world of um, PCs, and I learned how to code in a few other languages. That's my passion, that's what I always love to do. Um, and that really landed me uh, very early on in my, my life. A couple of great jobs, and one of those jobs was a small little um, consultant firm, a boutique firm that actually put me, when I was um, about 20 years old, in this place, Menlo Park. It's just right across the bay. I knew nothing about Silicon Valley. I'm dropped in here to work at a company that maybe you have heard is called Nuance Communications. Um, they did a lot of speech recognition stuff, super cool things, and I became hooked with the valley. That was uh, an amazing experience for me. Uh, this valley is so special, special to me. Um, and I worked for about a dozen, a dozen different startups. This, so you give you an idea, I see so many young faces. There's gonna be more than uh, a lesson in, in technology, a lesson in history. But um, this was 1999, uh, 2000, peak of the bubble, a lot of money in a lot of small companies, a lot of fun. And I was like, yeah, I wanna, I wanna be that. I wanna be an entrepreneur. Because I thought that entrepreneurship was um, hacking 24 by seven, uh, eating free food. I mean, we were working, but it was free, free food. Um, playing hard at your office. And then everybody felt like a millionaire. Everybody was a millionaire. Uh, and then something else happened after that. But at the time, I was like, I want to be an entrepreneur. That, if that is what it is, that's what I want to be. And little did I know that at the time, I was just planting my first seeds into what was going to become my next chapter, not only my career, but actually my life as well. And the um, story goes that go back to Argentina. And uh, around 2001, I decided to start my own company. Uh, it was a small consultant firm as well. I was working for a few firms in Latin America. Um, and one thing was for sure, when I came here, uh, I was determined to come back. Uh, I felt that Silicon Valley was the place to be if you were in technology uh, and if you were into starting your own business, and that's why you guys are all here as well. Um, and I was determined to do this. I was watching the video of a prior lecturer here, and he was trying to get out of you what entrepreneurship is. And I don't believe that there's one universal way of looking at it. For me, it's believing in something so forcefully and so truly that everything you do is so laser beam focused on making that dream real, that you start bending reality and you start making it happen. And I so badly wanted to come here that I can probably still dig out a few emails that I sent to Larry Ellison uh, saying that he should hire me and I should actually work for Oracle. He never replied to me, uh, so I'm still a little bit hurt about that. But, uh, but anyways, um, what happened a little bit later is that I got in touch with a CTO of a small company. There were about four people at the time. They had no money, um, and, uh, but they needed some, some work done. And I had met Uli, who was our former CTO at Medallia, uh, when I was here um, around 2000. And, um, and then the rest is history. I started working for Medallia around 2002 from Argentina. I moved up here and I grew myself, I grew the company, I grew the engineering team. And that's a little bit about what I want to talk today uh, to you. Uh, again, uh, history lesson. Um, anybody knows what that is? That picture over there? Uh, Pets.com. Pets Pets.com. And what happened with Pets.com? Exactly, one of the biggest, probably the most remarkable failure. Um, maybe after Webvan over here, I don't know if you guys remember that one, but um, a big, big failure. Um, 2001, dot com bubble burst, um, and my founders decide to start a company. Uh, perfect timing. Um, the company, as you heard before, is about customer experience management. So at the time, I had no idea what that was. Um, but I believed in the concept of helping companies deliver fantastic customer experiences, um, and it was a great idea. If you can think about it, at the time, um, the web was just really getting started, and, um, and we were focused on the hospitality industry because it makes sense. It's a, it's a place where you really need to take care of your customers. And what else happened in 2001? Pretty big deal, international. 9-11, exactly. And 9-10, um, my founders have a very important meeting um, pitching our idea, it was just a prototype, to Hilton. Um, we believe it went well. What we're offering is a prototype on this great next promise that was going to help them improve their customer experience. Um, 
And um, they kind of liked it. And then our founders woke up the next day to 9-11. And we said, OK, this is it. That's the end of the story. Who is going to travel? Who is going to make any investment in any promises? And um, to our surprise, actually, Hilton called a couple of weeks later. And we were in business. They wanted to see what we could do. And we built a great prototype. They really loved what they seen. And they became our first customers and our first investors. So one thing that is very special about Medallia is that we are a bootstrapped company, or at least we were a bootstrapped company until 2011. Who can tell me here what a bootstrapped company is? Yes. You didn't bring in outside capital? Exactly. So we had a small little seed capital. I think it was about $200,000 that was used to um, build a business plan or something like that. And then we just got our first, um, our first customer. And that is, for us, at least it was, our best investors. It was somebody that was validating the fact that whatever we were doing was worth something. And one customer led to another one. And that is how we built the company for the first pretty much 10 years of our, of our life. And uh, we have some um, brilliant brands. Um, and then something happened 10 years later which is you know, when you're starting something, and you probably learned this um, as well, you heard about it, all you're doing is just like pushing and pushing and pushing. And you're trying to find that itch to scratch, a market to fulfill. And you push and you try, and some companies pivot. And we did that for the first 10 years of our lives. And all of a sudden, things started to change. And we started to get the pull of the market. And all of a sudden, we didn't need to start to keep knocking on doors. And they wanted to have what we had to offer. And uh, Sequoia at the time, I don't know if you guys know how um, these guys work, uh, not only these guys, but all the VCs, what they do is they actually um, look for markets that are going to be really big three, four, five years down the line. And they try to identify those markets now. And then they go in there, and they try to see who's going to be the future winner. And they invest in those people. And they were looking for us. We were looking to grow. And that is what I want to talk about. So the first 10 years of our life has to do with uh, entrepreneurship and startup, bootstrapping, and really counting pennies. right? Um, but the learning that came after that is something that I wish somebody would have talked to me about. And I have just a few lessons, not a lot to, learn, to share today. But I think that hopefully, if you go through the hump of becoming a successful startup, you're going to face. And maybe you can remember a thing or two of what I'm going to say later. And you can see here our growth. You can see very clearly when we got the investment and we started to invest in our future moving forward. All right, let's get to it. If there's one thing that I want you to remember is this word culture. Don't even remember what I'm going to say after this. Just remember culture. And then eventually when you start your own company or you join your company and things start going south, just Google or YouTube company culture. And why is this important? And then you'll, you'll be fine. So just remember this, and you'll be golden. Um, but I do want to talk about culture, because this is probably the biggest pillar of our success. This is the, um, the glue that uh, holds us together. And I want to, it was so counterintuitive, at least to me, at the time that I was growing with this company, um, that I want to share quite a bit uh, about it. So what is culture anyways? Who can take a guess? What is culture within a company? Somebody, anything, a word. What is culture? What do you think it is? Yes? It's kind of like a mood. It's like a mood. Yeah, it's definitely like a mood. Yes? Shared values. Shared values, absolutely. What else? Where? Yes? You both hit it. It's like I see it, you guys, with, uh, with these two phrases. It's exactly that is, at least for me, is share values and expected behaviors. And the thing is that when you're growing, you just don't even realize this. It's not really, that, you know, it's not really written anywhere. And actually, these values are not um, stated. right? It's not skills that you put in a shop description. Um, it's hard to hire for it. You don't even know that it's there. And that was the first realization for me and the first lesson learned is that culture is already there. You just need to uncover it. You just need to um, take the dust off, and then it's right there in front of you. right? So it's just I want to tell you a little story 
Um, when we first started the company, we were just coming together. We just, it, the purpose was clear. We didn't have a mission statement or a vision statement. It was very simple. We has, had to keep the lights on uh, because we were bootstrapped. So it's very simple. You get food on the table, otherwise you die. So it's very, very simple to align. Um, as you start growing and you become successful, then all of a sudden you have more options. You have money to spend. You can do certain things. You decide what priorities you should go for. And then you start hiring people. And you start hiring people at a higher rate that you can assimilate that, um, that, that hire. And it happened to us that we actually started to get people that, funny enough, were brilliant, successful in the past, in the same space as we were. So they brought all the learners with them, right? This should be a, uh, a slum dunk. We got five, six people all at once. And it was fantastic because they knew what we were talking about. They could sell. They could service. It was fantastic. None of them worked. And we were like, what's going on? I mean, clearly, these people were successful before. And what we didn't realize is that there were these untold behaviors, expectations that we had for people, these core values. Before, it was very simple. We had a presentation the next day. And it was 5 PM. We had a good version of it. Um, we felt pretty good about it. And we all knew what that meant. It meant dinner in the office so we can make it perfect, right? But nobody told us that, right? We just behaved that way. And then all of a sudden, now you have a whole bunch of people that just, that is not how success is defined for them. It's not how they operate. And it's pretty awkward because you just don't have any experience telling people, oh, you should, you should now stay here and we're going to actually work on this until we feel really good about it, right? It's just the way you behave. So you need to start making it clear. You don't really build culture, you articulate your culture. And that is being seated there by your founders and by the early employees that are there that wishes just like come together and behave in the same way. Now, a lot of times you have seen maybe core values. Somebody here said values, right? Core values framed um, at companies like Enron, for example, you know, and integrity and those type of things are there. Um, that is a pretty useless way of actually using culture. Culture got to be a tool. It got to be useful. If it's not useful, it's worthless. And one way of making it really, really useful is to articulate it so you can hire for it. So for example, we have different core values and we have different behaviors. One of the behaviors that we expect is ownership. We look for ownership in the people we hire. What does this mean? It means that you don't wait for people to tell you what to do. If you see something broken, Go fix it if you think it's important. Somebody's telling you to do something that makes absolutely no sense. Why are you going to do it? Challenge it. Why are you going to do something that you believe is not really good? Um, useful means that you can test for it. So when you're interviewing people, you're looking for language. You're looking for stories. Am I blaming others for my bad luck? That's why I want to get out of this company. Um, is it always their fault when my projects are not working? Oh, I love this one. When the company starts becoming something, right? Uh, the company's direction, the company told me to do this, or uh, upper management, it coming from above. Management told me to do this, right? It's people. It's just all people. And everybody has their best intentions. And when you start detecting those type of little things in interviews, that's just a red flag for us. We want people that own the company, that own their future, that own their success. That's, uh, that's one example of how to do it. If you want to uh, implement it at scale, which is where we're right now, so we grew in two years from 300 people to 600 people, what we have right now is we have a dedicated team of cultural interviewers. These people get trained on how to um, deliver a cultural interview. They are trained to detect these little things that we first intuitively would do in an interview process. And we actually have one person that will do a cultural interview that is not in the org structure of the person that is hiring and has veto power. So I want to hire a brilliant engineer. I need to call, uh, say, Alex, who is in our uh, HR department. She's a fantastic cultural interviewer. She sits there. And if this person does not pass our cultural interview, I cannot hire the person. And that is how you actually go about really keeping your culture, because that is what, in the end, um, keeps your company afloat. And that's what actually fuels your growth. The one thing, um, just to give you a little break from you don't build culture and you just uncover it, it is OK to be aspirational. So when we actually sat down to articulate our culture, 
um, there was one thing that was kind of annoying us, and it was that as we grew, information was not flowing uh, freely through the company. We felt that we were being seen as the executive team that made all the decisions, and then we will communicate to the world what we we're going to do. And that was really not the way we wanted to build this company. So we weren't aspirational. We said that one of our core values was going to be open and honest communication. And that transpires in the way you give feedback, um, in how you do your performance reviews, and actually how you communicate your decisions and your thinking process. So right now we have every Friday, our CEO hosts fireside chats, and we share very openly um, what is going on, what's going right, what's not going right. Every company meeting every quarter, we share our results. Uh, you know, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. And we're pretty open about our own mistakes as well. Uh, so it's okay to be aspirational. I don't think that we're perfect yet in this. Um, probably we're never gonna be. Uh, but it is okay to have one, maybe two core values, but you have to articulate it. You have to write it down and it has to be useful. If it's not a tool, it's totally worthless. All right, it's so lesson number one, lesson on culture. Lesson number two, when you're growing and you're growing fast, if you don't figure out recruiting, you die. Period, that's it. You gotta figure out recruiting. Recruiting is the fuel. New, new people coming, in, uh, coming on the bus is the fuel for your success. You have no fuel, you go nowhere. You have bad fuel, you eventually break your engine. So you have to figure this out. And I, again, one more time, uh, that's a human nature. We always learn through failure, um, or at least we learn better through failure than from successes. You have to figure this out. Um, one more time, when you start a company, when you're in startup mode, you come to places like this one, you meet people, very smart people, energized. You, can, you kind of network your way through, and you can basically build your company you know, up to 10, 15, 20 people. But when you need to take it from a couple hundred to a couple more hundred, that becomes a real challenge. Nobody teaches you that. It's really, really difficult to do, at least it was for me, particularly in this valley where you know, there's a lot of opportunity. So everybody read this, hire slow and fire fast. In reality, when you're growing, you gotta hire fast. You just cannot hide behind this notion like, oh, we're waiting for the right person to show up, or you know, our, bias, our bar is super high, we cannot really find the smart engineer. So you gotta take your bets, and you gotta learn how to do it. So if you wanna learn how to get people on your bus, uh, one thing that I learned when we, um, when we took our, um, our money from Sequoia and we hired a fantastic, phenomenal, head of sales is that sales um, is the way you want to, uh, is the, the way you want to look to learn how to recruit. If you think about it, very similar scenarios. And I'm not talking about the um, kind of the sleek sales guy that is trying to sell you the used car on the weekend. I'm, I'm talking about real salespeople, right? And what I learn about our sales organization is that they have something to offer um, they have somebody that they want to sell this to, and they are trying to actually convince them to get on board as a customer. And that is so similar to what you're trying to do when you want to recruit. You, in my case, it was engineering a medallia. Have an elite, fantastic engineering team. Um, I wanted to offer that to a lot of you. And, um, and I needed to go out there and explain why you needed to join uh, medallia. And um, I was doing a pretty poor job at it. It's not easy, it's not easy to do that. Um, and one thing that I learned from this guys is methodology is super, super important. Um, I was the slick sales guy. I always just wanted to talk about like, the cool challenges we have and how great our technology is and how great our culture is. And the truth is that the first thing you gotta do really is just focus on what are you really, 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 really good at. You have to first figure out what is that thing that makes you unique in this world as a company? And you always have something. And if you don't, you're just like, you gotta go somewhere else because you don't wanna be in a company that is not really, 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 really good at something. Um, for us, it had to do with uh, real-time big data. We are the masters of being able to crunch a ton of data in almost no time because that's what we want to offer to our customers. That was from a challenge perspective, very, very important. The other thing that we offer as a small company is impact. Every engineer that comes is Christian, is Torval, is Joe, is Diego, it doesn't matter. We hand them the keys and they can break the whole thing or they can make us super successful. 
And that type of impact, you cannot really get at a big company. Only a few people can get that, big, that type of big impact in a big company. So those are our differentiators. And then you want to match your differentiators with the desires of the people that you're trying to hire. And you have to um, qualify your candidates. Who can tell me, do you guys know a little bit about the sales cycle? Can anybody tell me what qualifying is in a sales cycle? Venture a guess? No? I can, I can always count on you. Exactly, exactly. You, you got to identify your um, target audience. You got to identify who is interested in what you have to offer. And if they are not, then you have to walk away, as tough as it is. So in our case, when we have the, uh, in my case, the engineers, that what they want is they want their Google t-shirt, or they want to tell everybody that they work for Facebook because that is important to them. I qualify them out. That's not what we have to offer. I cannot offer that. I don't waste my time. They're doing cool things. We're doing cool things. We're just not meant to be together, at least not right now. So what I need to do is I need to find the people that actually are looking for the things that we have to offer and move on from those that they look super smart. They actually are super smart. They can really work out, but they're just not looking for the things that we have to offer. Move on and, uh, and find people that, uh, that actually match that special thing that you, uh, that you have. Second thing that you want to do is really learn how to interview. And actually, this goes both ways. So you're going to either go ahead and start your company, or you're going to go and join, hopefully, a vibrant, great company. So if there's one book that I will read if I was looking for a job, is this book. I read it because I'm looking for people that are looking for jobs. And, um, and it's brilliant. And one of the key takeaways, and you should read it, it's really good. Um, but one of the key takeaways here is learn how to interview and learn, learn how to look for the things that you're looking for. So um, as um, Vicky, right, was saying, um, I, was, um, I was looking for great engineering managers um, a while ago. And uh, I was getting really frustrated because in my interviews, I will get the philosophers and I will get the um, the people that will ponder on things, but I couldn't find the people that have done it. So in this book, you really understand how to interview to detect these things. So when I will ask, tell me how do you run your engineering team? Tell me how you measure success. I will get things like, um, a great engineering team should blah, blah, blah. And then I will get things like, well, a great process starts with this, 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 and that. And it was um, almost reciting a book answer. And what I was really curious to know is, how do you really, really do it? And this is what this book tells you to do, whether you're interviewing somebody or you're interviewing for a position. It's just tell your story. Tell me exactly how you do it. I'm curious to know, how do you run your meetings? How do you measure success? How do you know that your team is a high-performing team? How do you know if a team member is performing or not? Um, what type of agenda do you bring to your one-on-ones? How do you set a vision for your team? How do you inspire? Those things are very, very important. And I want to know, know how it should be done. I want to know how you do it. So then I can know that you can actually come and join Medallia and do it for me. So um, two great pieces of advice for me. Learn from the best sales guys who really know how to do it, the good ones. Um, and read that book. It's actually pretty good. Uh, a little gem from our recruiting team. So hire slow, actually hire fast, and fire faster. So this is very, very important. Because you're, fi you're hiring fast and you need to bring so many people on board, you have to take chances. Um, always err on the side of the brilliant and inexperienced over the smart and the knowledgeable. Always, 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 always. Uh, always go for raw horsepower because you're going to be facing things that you never faced before. So you want somebody that's eager to go, eager to learn, and eager to tackle bigger things than themselves. Um, other than just using the same old tools all the time. But sometimes you make a mistake, and you need to move really quickly. The way we look at it is this way, very simple, very pragmatic. Two axes, wheel, skill. You have four quadrants, and it's very, very simple. You want to spend most of your time working on that movement with your people. So you want to be on the high wheel, um, low skill, always pushing people forward, right? towards the upper quadrant. Um, the upper quadrant, are your, they are your lieutenants. Those are the people that you delegate 
um, and you put them in, in, in real, real positions to uh, achieve greatness and to fail. And if they fail, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt, but they're going to learn. And that is, that, is the, that is the column where you want to be. On this side, it's all about sense of urgency and being really, really impatient. So if you think about low, low wheel, low skill, today uh, we're just running a leadership training with the executive team. Uh, we're talking about days. So how much time do you spend? You spend days on that. If you don't move to the, to the column on the right, you have to be out. This is where you actually put a performance management in place, days. On the top, high skill, low will, very tricky. This is where you get your heroes. This is where you get your rock stars. The people that say, well, you know, this is not my job, right? I mean, I know how to do that, but you know, this is not why I've been here. This is not why I'm hired, right? Um, those we're talking about weeks. And actually, you don't performance manage. You performance plan. So they need to save, um, to, to save themselves. You don't go there. They have the skill. They can do it on their own. And if they don't buy into it in weeks, you just got to move on. It's just not the right place for you. And then eventually you move into months, and then hopefully there you, you stay for most of the time. But you got to make your decisions quick. And this is something, again, we're not talking about you starting um, at the 10, 15, 20, even up to 100 people. We're talking about when you're hiring really, really fast from the 300 on. There's something that you can just not sit on it. You can just not sit on it. You got to course correct very, very quickly. All right? Hire fast, fire faster. Another lesson learned, and uh, this connects directly to my frustration on the whole engineering management um, search and understanding. Um, you've got to develop your leaders really, really early on. And this is actually very counterintuitive. At least it was counterintuitive to me. Uh, when you're an entrepreneur, um, the word management is like a bad word. It's just you do. You don't manage anything, you, you just do. You just see something broken, and you fix it, and you move on, and you get the next deal, and you get the next version of the product out. You just don't need to manage anything other than yourself. Um, and then when you think about management, like, oh, we don't need that. Why is that needed? Big, big mistake. You have to identify and invest in your leaders really, really early on. Because what happens is when the, um, you're, hold on. <laughs> It's just so funny. You first try to create inertia, right? Because you just, it's all friction. It's all, you know, the market is not accepting your, your product. And, you know, you don't know if this release is going to work. Will this customer cancel their subscription? You just, it's all friction, right? And all of a sudden, boom, the market starts sucking you in. And it's all inertia. So now you need to start breaking it because they're taking you places that maybe you don't want to go. And who can, who can actually break inertia in your team? Well, we're all doers. We all know how to, you know, build more code in my case. Um, well, now we need, I don't know, um, a new quality initiative or, you know, the word initiative starts starting, it starts like creeping in, right? And you actually have to do something about it. And there's nobody there that actually can do it or knows how to do it. Uh, and that is really, really devastating. And that was um, why, at least in my way, I learned the hard way. I had to now go out there and look for a manager somewhere else. Uh, and it was really tough because I haven't done that in the past. Now I need to learn how to do it. Uh, and then I learned that you know, there's not a lot of uh, good ones out there, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, but anyways, how can you fix this? Now reflecting back, we have a couple of success uh, stories within Medali as well. First thing, hire in two different ways. One, above yourself. What that means is you hire people that are smarter than you, more experienced than you. Uh, if you're in an, in an interview with somebody for an hour and you did not learn a thing, that person should not join your company, period. They have to teach you something. How is it possible that you're sitting across a very interesting person and you have not learned anything? Maybe you're arrogant, and that's why you didn't learn anything. But if you're really curious about the other people, um, you actually should learn something. So hire above yourself. And the other thing that is also counterintuitive for the most part, particularly if you're coming from a big company, is that you need to hire above role. In a fast-growing company, what is growing around you is the company. So the challenges are getting bigger. So if you hire somebody that is overqualified, it's OK. In a couple of months, it's probably going to be underwater. Because the problems that you're going to face and you're going to see are going to be bigger than what you ever imagined. So hire above yourself, hire above role. We actually have a, a graduate from, um, from here, from um, the Haskell business. I remember back in 2004, we hired him. Um, and I remember talking to Steve Erwaker, who's one of our 
early, early VPs, and I asked him, hey, how's, um, how did Jamie do? Uh, and Jamie was interviewing. And I was like, oh, he, he is brilliant, he's fantastic. I think he's a little bit too overqualified, though. But we don't mind a little overqualification. And at the time, believe me, I didn't understand what he said. Um, but now I understand, because he's um, our VP of services, and he grew with us. And the reason why he could do that is because when he started, he was definitely doing the work that he probably was way overqualified to do. But he was able to grow with us, and actually he allowed us to grow. So this is one way that you can fix it. Hire people that are bigger than the job that they have, and believe me, the company is going to take care of the rest. The other one is identify your potential leaders and just give them a boatload of responsibility. And actually, if you're going to go and find a job, make sure that this happens. Make sure that the people that you're actually going to work for understand that you want to grow and that they give you a real, real chance to actually fail in a big way within the company, that they give you a boatload of responsibility. And that is how you do it. You hire above yourself, and you actually invest in your, um, in your leaders uh, early, early, early on. And you know what? Another thing that I learned, because I didn't do this early enough, is that when you go out there and you hire good people from the outside, actually a little bit of diversity is really, really good. We hire yet another Cal um, graduate a um, couple months ago. Um, great senior director of engineering. He's coming from Twitter. Uh, he's been at VMware before. Extremely successful person. He's seen things that we haven't seen yet. And it's been great because he has seen scale. He has seen failure. He has seen success that we had no idea even existed. So a little, a little bit of cross-pollination every now and again comes really handy. Uh, so it's not that bad after all. But believe me, as much as you can, promote within. All right? Develop your leaders really, really early on. Start now. Four, perspective. Probably my favorite topic. Perspective is such a great tool. Even right now, I'm standing here. I'm looking at some people over there. I have no idea how tall you are because I'm standing here. Probably you from here see me really big, but I'm hopefully not that big. Um, I'm now here trying to share with you some learnings. I really don't know much, that much. Probably not that much more than what you guys know right now. But it looks different, right? So perspective is everything, and it's a great tool. I wish I knew how to um, make nice uh, perspective, how to actually say, I'm going to have perspective now and have it. I don't know how to do it, but I learned a couple of lessons about perspective, and I want to share with you. And you got to be at the lookout for it. One story I want to share is about perks. So when you're growing and we were bootstrapped, um, we didn't have a lot of money like all the startups that, uh, that you see or the ones that I saw um, early on, 1999, 2000. Um, so we didn't have a lot of money, and I don't remember exactly how it started, but I do remember that one of my engineers all of a sudden planted the seed on our CEO that we're actually going to sponsor a ski trip to Tahoe for the entire company. And I'm like, we don't have the money to do this. Uh, how is this going to happen? We had a little bit of extra money, and we did it. We did it one year. We did two years. Now the company's growing. And this is getting more, you know, it's getting more and more expensive. Um, and in any company, you hit some rough patches. And I don't remember exactly which year it was, but we didn't really have a lot of money to spend. We were still bootstrapped. And um, we're looking at our budgets, and we're looking at our money. And here's the spends for the ski trip. And um, I don't really need a lot of perks. I just love what I do. I just go to work. I go home. I just don't need much. Uh, so I'm like, we're cutting this. This is actually not what we need. Um, and I remember at the time, our CEO uh, put his foot down and basically said, no, we're not cutting this. Um, this, is, uh, this is part of who we are. This is part of our tradition. And um, we're going to have to find money somewhere else. And at the time, believe me, I did something that a leader never does, which is I just shut up there. And I basically went out there. And I didn't believe in what he said. And I just I remember going home and talking to my wife about it and just explaining how wrong it was, right? A uh, real leader will have confronted him right there and just tried to understand. He definitely had a different perspective. He was seeing something that I was not seeing. Um, but I failed him that way. And then I understood, uh, probably many years afterwards, that this was part of our culture. That in the end, it's all about people. So a company is nothing more, nothing more and nothing less than a group of people coming together to do something fantastic. 
And if you cut this type of things, you're going to cut your potential really, um, really short. And uh, it's, it's the perspective that I was missing was probably the, of uh, one of the um, one of that of um, an inexperienced executive, if you want. So the way he was looking at it is, think about this in a yearly way, employee per employee. How much does it cost us? I was looking at it as a big uh, lump of money. Um, and what we get in return. So what is the investment per employee that we do? It's nothing compared to the joy that it brings to know um, the kids of my coworkers. And when the, t rough, uh, the rough time comes, Having a strong culture and strong people beside you is really, really important. So if I were ever to start another company, uh, I now know the importance of these type of things. And what I was missing there, why I got so upset, is I was missing perspective. This one is uh, it's a little bit tougher, you know. Um, again, remember we're talking about surviving success, right? So everything is going well. Uh, you're growing as a company. I was growing as an individual, and I still remember I was in the office with my CEO. It was a couple of weeks before our user conference, and we're cooking up our product roadmap. And, um, and we're coming up with these great ideas of where the product should go, of what the product should be. Um, and I want to confess, I felt important. I felt really important because I was deciding the future of this company. And, um, and when I come out of this, uh, this meeting, and it was maybe 6 PM, and I knew that my wife was waiting for me, um, and, but it was just so freaking important. Um, and I get to my desk, and I have 14 missed calls from my wife. Just to cut the tension now, nothing happened. Everything is fine. But at the time, my three-year-old son has fell down the stairs, um, and he hit his head. And they were in the emergency room, and he was vomiting, and he was a bit unconscious, right? Believe me, uh, the trip, I live very close to the, uh, to the office, uh, 15 minutes to the emergency room. Um, the lesson in perspective that I got in that car ride back uh, to the emergency room, I still not only remember it, uh, but I'm trying to teach you something here today. Um, don't take yourself too seriously. We're all driven, you know, overachiever. We all want to change the world. Uh, be driven, but not rushed. And always bring perspective to your life is so important. Whatever it is. For me, it's family. For you, it might be something else. But it's super important. Always bring perspective. And last but not least, growing is painful. And the perspective that you gain on this one is that it's just two sides of the same coin. Um, and if you're so afraid of failure that you're never going to try anything, you're just never going to grow. And you're just ne never going to get better. The one thing to remember is it's just never going to get easier. So failure hurts, and it's always going to hurt. Nothing is going to take the pain away, um, particularly if you're driven and you like to be perfect and you like to achieve great things. It's just going to hurt. But you've got to keep trying, because there's nothing to lose. Um, and this is, this is something important, particularly for you guys that are in a great school like this one, um, that you managed to get in, that you're probably getting all great grades, you're going to go out there and, or maybe not, <laughs> you're going to get out there and, uh, and you're going to want to keep getting those A's. And it's not about that anymore. It's just not about that. It's about trying things, taking risks, uh, and moving on. All right? Perspective, probably the biggest tool that I, that I know of. And you know, when everything else fails, you got to go back to your core. You got to go back to why. You just, uh, you know, all the rest of the things. I could probably, like, you know, do you still remember culture? I said that that's the only thing that you needed to remember, right? You probably already forgot about that. Um, but you know what? Like, you wake up in the morning, uh, particularly if you're in a startup. You work really, really long hours. Um, you. Uh, you spend more time with your coworkers than with your family. That's the truth. Um, you have fun and all, but um, that is the truth. So if you don't know really why you're doing it, you've got to stop and you've really got to answer that. Um, because that is the only thing that you can go back to when everything else fails. And this is the last lesson that I have here to share with you. But if you allow me, um, what I would love to do is I would love to share why I do what I do. 
Um, and to do that, what I want to do is I want to share a story that actually really touched me and really put in perspective um, what is the, the important job that I have and that Medallia has. Um, this story um, happens uh, somewhere in North America. Uh, picture a small little town. I don't think it looks like this, but this is how I imagined it. Um, it is a true story, though. And in this Walmart, there's a, um, a hair salon. And this is a story about a particular uh, woman hairdresser in that salon. Her name is Kim. And it was a typical busy day. And the mom comes uh, in through the doors of the of the salon, pushing a shopping cart, and in the cart, there is a kid. His name is Suck, and he was clearly not happy. Um, but there's something more about him. Suck is special. Um, he has autism. And the mom approaches Kim, and she explains that Suck needs a haircut, uh, and that it's not going to be easy. Um, there's no way that he's getting out of the cart. He's no way getting into the chair, and he's probably going to kick and scream, uh, and he's going to move. Um, like there's no tomorrow, and it's maybe going to be dangerous. Uh, but he needs a haircut, um, and Kim doesn't hesitate. She just like goes in and out, cuts Sack's hair beautifully and as fast as possible. She didn't ponder. She was not afraid of it. She just did it. You know, when, um, when I heard this story, I didn't realize um, how big of a deal um, personal hygiene is for families with autistic kids. Uh, Sack's uh, hair was matted in the back from sleeping. And every time he needed to get a haircut, it was a big deal for the whole family uh, to go do it. And in the words of this mom, um, Kim became their personal angel. Uh, and that really touched me. Uh, if you think about it, um, Kim really had a safe, um, safe choice. She had a choice. Uh, she could have very safely just said, uh, I'm not cutting this, not to bother. And I don't mean it in a bad way. Um, but if you think about it, right, and you think about how she's been measured, how she's incentivized, there's absolutely nothing in that business that tells her that cutting Sack's hair is the right thing to do. Probably quite the opposite, right? Think about that. Let me change the tack here really quick. Have you guys taken a taxi at all in your lives? Yeah? Yeah, many of you. Um, what about Uber? Can you raise your hands if you tried Uber? Yeah? Oh, that's awesome. Um, any difference in experience between a taxi cab and an Uber? No? Yes? Maybe? Anybody believes that the Uber experience is better than the taxi experience? Yeah, right? But if you think about it, right, it's kind of the same principle, right? It's, uh, it's a driver, it's a car, and a passenger that needs to be taken from point A to point B. If I describe it this way, taxi cab, Uber, pretty much no difference. Both of them need to make money. Both of them need to be efficient. Uh, efficient. Both of them probably have systems that measure both of those things. And yet, there's one tiny difference that makes for all the difference between those two things. And it's that Uber has what? They have a system to measure customer experience. And before you can actually pay, you have to rate that experience. These drivers need to get paid as well, but they care about something else, too. And it's interesting when they have to make a decision between um, you know, helping you with your luggage or not, or just driving you safely to your destination. They're thinking about revenue, but they're thinking about the experience they're delivering to you as well. I just find this fascinating. Just one little change, and all of a sudden, two complete different experiences. Now, Kim didn't really do this because she, her job told her to do this. Um, she didn't do it because she was being um, rewarded for it. She did it because it just felt right. And honestly, if we all in this room had the courage to do what she did, we probably would have done it as well. But then when you, um, when you actually uh, take a look at um, how we're being um, measured, um, and you take a look at revenue, and you take a look at numbers, right? It's really hard for that uh, to always win. And if you think about it, this is most businesses nowadays. They all have systems to measure revenue. They all have systems to measure um, performance. Um, but 
definitely is not, um, it's not easy to think about the customer experience. And to be honest with you, if you, the funny thing is that when you go to that hair salon, and actually this is a pretty big chain, and, um, and you go from everybody from Kim all the way to the CEO, and you ask them whether they should cut sex hair, they will all say yes. But then when they turn around and they look at the quarterly goals and they look at their annual goals, all this vanishes and dissipates, right? And, um, and I want to ask you, what if we could be the system that can actually fix that? What if we could be a system where, you know, doing the right thing is always the right thing to do? And then businesses are not about money anymore, but about something else. You know, as it turns out, the story about Kim and Sack keeps going. And, um, and Sack and mom kept coming back to the salon. And um, Sack went from the shopping cart to the actual chair. Bebon and everything. And nowadays, after Kim finishes cutting Sack's hair, he actually goes ahead and hugs her and says, thank you. And this is for a kid that actually has about five words in his vocabulary. Uh, that's pretty fantastic. That's doing the right thing. And that for me, for me, is what business really, really is. Um, it's all about the human connection. And it looks like so many businesses have lost track of this. They live in a world where people like Kim actually do exist, uh, but we don't know about them. They get totally lost, they get diluted, numbers of efficiency and revenue. But if you ask me what I really, really think, it's a pretty, pretty broken world. And that is what we do. We want to fix this. We help companies see the world in color. And when you walk into an Apple store or when you stay on an Airbnb, you can totally tell the difference. You can totally do. And are they perfect? By no stretch of the imagination. Are they better just because they're our customers? Absolutely not. But there's one thing that is for sure, and is that they cannot do it without us. We have the privilege to design, build, and operate the system that this business rely on. The privilege to build a system that they're using to take care of what really, really matters. And that's why I do what I do. Now, if you're here, listen to this fool, go find what makes you tick and make something happen. And that's all I have for today, and I would love to answer some questions now. So I, I, I want to take uh, two questions, so make sure they're good ones. Do I have two questions? Uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, Sorry, I took too long. I was not keeping track of time. Uh, that's all right. I, I could have helped you keep track of time. I just got kind of caught up in the story. Uh, I actually wanted to say one thing. I don't know uh, if you all remember, but when Oren Hoffman was here, he had talked very adamantly about looking for a company that will let you fail. Remember, I, if, if anybody recalls him saying that, which sounded like a bit of an arrogant thing to say, but it's interesting. And I think that's exactly what you are offering people, is the opportunity to, fa to fail in a positive Absolutely. way, uh, taking that risk. But I also wanted to ask you, you talked a little bit, or you talked a lot about culture. Yep. And I am wondering for everybody here, and as we you know uh, move down towards Skydeck, what's a question that as, an, um, as a um, potential hire, we can ask a company to better, what's the best question you can think of to ask to better understand a culture? It's just straight up, what's your culture? And just look at people mumble. Because I don't know that there's a lot of companies out there that can actually articulate what their culture is. Uh, ask them um, how important is culture for them? Uh, we actually, I was just uh, talking to Mike, who's sitting there. He was um, deciding to either to join us um, as head of recruiting or join, uh, joining Uber. Um, and um, he told me, you know, I went and then asked um, my future boss, how did they think about culture? And uh, what she said was, we don't have time for that now. And now he's here with us. Uh, it's, it's really, really important. Just ask straight up, who's the guardian of the culture? Another great question. So I, I wanted to say one other thing about Medallia, which is interesting. I mean, you talk about it being a smaller company, but in the customer experience management space, yep. I think Medallia is one of the biggest companies. We are, so the, I just yeah, we are to, the leaders, yes. And, and I, I don't work there, obviously, so I, I just wanted to clarify that. But I am curious, how many employees are there now? Right now, we're about 600. And last year? 
Um, I think we were about uh, shy of 400. So that's a 50, I mean, that's, that's 50% insane. growth. I cannot so even huge. calculate it anymore. In any case, join us down at Skydeck. Enjoy the evening. Enjoy some appetizers and uh, enjoy the walk down. And I'm serious. If you feel like you can't walk down and you're the first four pers people, I'll, I'll drive you down there. Thank you so much.